delighted <laughs> to, um, to introduce Chris Hunter, who is a former publisher and editor of the Pacifica Tribune. I know there are Pacificans in here somewhere. Um, and we welcome you. And he has been his, history oriented all his life. He's written other books. Um, and he wrote The Ocean Shore Railroad. So he's the guy with the info. And here he is, Chris Hunter. I live in Pacifica, and I drove down here this afternoon, and as I was driving by, I realized the same view, the same love, the same excitement about living on the coast existed in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. The exact same emotion. And it was what inspired people to say, you know, we have a lot of people in San Francisco, and we have a lot of people in Santa Cruz. There's nobody in between except along in Redwood City. Why don't we make a train that's going to bring commuters and vacationers to this beautiful coast? It's a very interesting history, beginning of it. And what I want to say is that it's sometimes considered a magnificent failure. Uh, some of the previous people who wrote about this great effort, um, coined Jack Wagner wrote a book called The Last Whistle Stop. And people have considered this sort of a magical, interesting history of the coastside. And many of you probably know much of what I'm going to say tonight. For example, I often point out to people that come to visit us in Pacifica, oh, have you seen the, the shelf that the Ocean Shore Railroad went along along Rockaway Beach, or down through Pedro Point? Or have you been to the, the Valimar Station restaurant and eat, which was a, an original um, station there in Valimar? So the point of that I'm making is I, I felt the same way tonight as I have for 30 years coming along here and driving through what is now the Devil's Slide Tunnel, the Tom Lantos Tunnels. When I wrote this book 10 years ago, I put in that it would cost $300 million. It ended up costing $500 million to build that one mile long tunnel, which was inspired by people wanting to come along the coast, come to the Cap Coast, and the road in Devil's Slide. How many of you have been to the park at Devil's Slide, which is the old roadway? That used to be the train tracks, and then it became Highway 1, and then it was like, this is not working anymore. <laughs> it's going to cut off everything south of the tunnel of the Devil's Slide to this area of Happen Bay. And so they worked for many years. There are people here tonight who were in, in that effort to not let them build a roadway and they built a tunnel instead. Um, how many people here know that it costs a million dollars a year to operate that tunnel? It, it is a permanent part of the Caltrans budget, and it costs a million dollars a year. And so that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, that when they, they put in a tunnel, it costs a lot of money to run the tunnel. We're talking about trains briefly. I just came back from a vacation in Japan, and when I... <laughs> I got to tell you, I love trains. I've loved trains since I was a little boy. And I've been on a trains, and trains do not go as fast as they do in Japan. <laughs> Let me tell you, they know trains in Japan. Um, I, my wife and I went on probably four different kinds of train. The slowest train in Japan is faster than our fastest train in America. There's actually only two high-speed rails in this country. One of them is on the northeast corridor, and the other is a private, privately built train in Florida now called Brightline, which is a private company that's going to build a high-speed rail from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Not a government train, it's, and they can do it. You all maybe were living here in 2008, and you voted, I hope you voted, for the high-speed rail in California. Well, where is it? <laughs> it was supposed to open in 2020. That was the original goal. We were going to have it finished, and it was going to be open. Now, the governor is saying, we might vote cannon. So I, I'm not going to be political about that train, but it ain't here. And they're building it out in the middle of nowhere. A 
in the middle of California, and maybe that part of the train you can go from Merced to Bakersfield, I think. Um, <laughs> but it was sold to us, the train was sold to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And this is the same thing that, that people sold the Ocean Shore Railroad. And not to go all the way to San, San, between San Francisco and Los Angeles, but San Francisco and Santa Cruz. And they sold it with the idea that, oh, this is so beautiful, as I said in the beginning of this, of this talk. I mean, everybody loves the coast. And everybody hates the fact that everybody loves the coast. <laughs> Especially lately, since they built the tunnel, and people are no longer afraid to come to Half Moon Bay. But when, when the original, and, and we're talking about when it was the Ocean Shore Railway, with the original effort to build this project, which was going to be from San Francisco down to Santa Cruz. And the excitement of that was, once we get past this horrible, rocky area, you know, Pacifica to just, just south of uh, Moss Beach, that area there, that was the hardest part of building the Ocean Shore Railroad. That was, everything after that was gravy. I mean, you know Happen Bay, it's like, Coming, to, coming along half Moon Bay, the, the Ocean Shore Railroad from here was easy as pie. <clears throat> what was difficult was Pacifica, and just south of Pacifica, what we call Devil Slide. And so the other thing that's interesting that I touch on is that everybody goes on Highway 1 <coughs> after the tunnel, which is a whole history of itself, and the Devil Slide, then you get into that rocky, rocky area and there's there's cuts and people always look at those cuts and I hope this doesn't happen <laughs> anyway um, they were going to build tunnels through that area different tunnels and then they said that's going to be too expensive so so we're going to just blow up these cuts and there are several of them and they're the cuts from the Ocean Shore Railroad so <coughs> Let me tell you about this, my experience with this. Um, I was fascinated by this when I worked at the Pacific Tribune from 1990 until 2007. So 17 years I was working at the Pacific Tribune. And I always supported the Pacific Historical Association, Society. They used to call it the Pacific Hysterical Society, but I, that's what <laughs> Paul Azevedo used to call it all the best. And, and then I had the opportunity to meet Kathleen Manning, who has this fabulous store called Prince Old, Old Prince Prince Old and Yeah. And Prince Old and Rare. Internationally famous um, store that she and it's like a, it was like a magic thing, something out of you know Harry Potter it was so magical. But anyway, there's a lot of people who really were interested in this, including um, Bill Drake at the time, now, Bill Drake didn't, I never worked with Bill Drake at the Pacific Tribune. He sold the Pacific Tribune in 1988, and I started working there in 1990. So I never, it never I knew him really well, and I, I, I got to know him really well. He was, he was a, one of those people that was an old time newspaper man. He, he owned the Pacific Tribune and made it into a really, you know, terrific community newspaper. But I started looking through all of the files that we had at the Pacific Tribune, and I noticed all of these pictures of the Ocean Shore Railroad. And I, I didn't know a lot about the Ocean Shore Railroad at the time. So I researched it and researched it, and I figured out a way. I spent about a year working on pictures that we had at the Pacific Tribune, and the San Mateo County History um, Museum had them. And I said, well, this is a great idea. I'm going to write like a novel about what it was like to be on the Ocean Shore Railroad. And then Mitch Postal at the History Museum said, well, you can't use our pictures. It'll cost you $50 a picture. We're not going to let anybody use these pictures at the History Museum. So then I feel, felt like I was in trouble. And I found, and I'll show you pictures later in this, I found some guys who were modelers, the Vargas Brothers. And these two men, their brothers, and they were the most expert model-making guys I've ever seen. They loved trains, and they loved models, and they put them. And for, for some reason, they just were excited about the Ocean Trail Railroad. They built models 
of the Ocean Shore Railroad, including a gigantic one that showed the whole system as it existed. And they were amazing people. And I worked with them, and they had access to a lot of the pictures that I couldn't get through other, other ways. And so I used a lot of their pictures, and I wrote a whole chapter about them. And I'll tell you about them, too, because there's an interesting aspect of the story that a lot of people don't know, but I don't want to. I don't want to jump around too much. But I was very proud of this book. It opened up the Arcadia, um, you know, history book system here in Northern California. It was the first book, and then maybe many of you have seen other books. Everything that I think uh, Matt, somebody is doing a Daily City book now. People have done tons of these books. This. The Pacifica book was the very first one, and and so many other people. I think we have people in this room who've done their own books, Happen Bay and Pacifica, and, and that company, Arcadia, figured out that people love history. And all over this country, you can see these little these little golden books in communities. I mean, I I bought a book for my mother-in-law about Hibbing, Minnesota. They had done a history book about Hibbing, Minnesota. <laughs> Everyone else in the world only knows that Bob Dylan came from Hibbing, Minnesota. <laughs> but the book is all about the post office and all the, and the, and the, the music. There's a uh, high school there that's one of the most, at one time it was the wealthiest high school in the United States because it was made with the iron ore money that was there in that part. And so every element of any community has a great history to it. And Half Moon Bay, Pacifica, are linked by the history of the Ocean Shore Railroad and San Francisco. Now the problem is that in 1905, everybody was so, so excited. They had been working on the train, the stations, they had been, you know, people were selling things, they were just going nuts with the, with the exciting potential of bringing a train and, and let me tell you something else. I drove down here today in an electric car that I love. I love it. There's an electric charger out here. The first railroad project for the Ocean Shore was actually going to be electric. And we're talking about 1905. They were so excited about this possibility of opening up the coast side and having people come. They also did a lot of political maneuvering to make lots in Pacifica and south of Pacifica, small, like 25 feet wide instead of the, and so when I was working at the newspaper, I was always writing stories about the county attorney or the city attorney trying to merge these lots together so people could buy and, and build on a regular size lot. And so I used to say, well, you know the, the reason that they're 25 foot? Because <laughs> the Ocean Shore Railroad was going to sell them. To tourists and people would cotton build cottages on them. It was going to be like the East Coast. Well, there's a reason that Rockaway Beach is called Rockaway Beach. It's, it's mimicking the East Coast. It's not. They didn't invent the name Rockaway Beach. It, it was in the on the East Coast, and it was a tourist area. And so there was always this dream that the coast side, which was empty, and I have a couple of pictures that, um, that I'll show you as I as I. On. But anyway, let me just, uh, the, this desolate area was going to be the site of an amazing tourist commuter this, um, location. And, and this is the most famous marketing ploy that they came up with. They came up with this, this idea, oh, it reaches the beaches. And, and what I said at the beginning of this is people then loved the ocean. They loved, on a summer day, they had all of these excursions that were coming out. Because it did work for, everybody knows what happened in 1906, right? Well, that was the worst business coincidence for the Ocean Shore Railroad. <laughs> That, that was imaginable because they had started coming out through Daly City to, to Muscle Rock and, and then down and everything, all the rolling stock collapsed and fell into the ocean and, and ruined that whole effort. But the trains were still working between Daly City and San Francisco and so the little train 
helped after the earthquake by moving debris, and, 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 and so it, it had a lot to do with the history of San Francisco, too. Um, many of you probably know that that, that whole area is, you can't find much about the Ocean Shore Railroad in San Francisco, but they actually had a lot of uh, activity at that time, and it was all, it took them a while to figure out, it took a whole new uh, group of investors, and they, in, Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Anyway, they... <laughs> a whole new set system of investors. This is what I was mentioning to you. In Pacifica, there was nothing. I mean, it was sand dunes and artichokes. And the idea to have a little train that was going to go through Pacifica, they looked at that and they said, it's all empty, so we can sell all of that for housing and for you know, cottages, for vacationers, and, and the other half of the other thing was, was commuters or people living in San Francisco could get on a train and come and see what we all love for the day and go back. And the marketing of that, I'm telling you, it's the same marketing as anywhere in the world to get people to go to some place that's really, really nice. And they didn't have any trouble getting people excited about this. And, and, and at one point, when the Ocean Shore Railroad was actually functioning really well, there was 20,000 people getting on that over the course of a week, going back and forth. There was four uh, trains a day, back and forth, as far as it went. And they were so excited about it that they ran out of money, and they ran out of time, and they couldn't build the rest of the train to Santa Cruz, partly because the Southern Pacific didn't want any little railroad interfering with their commercial aspects. So they put a spur line across it, down getting into Santa Cruz. So there's just a, there was just a tiny little, like almost an outhouse kind of station in Santa Cruz, because they couldn't get there on a train, so they, they had these um, Stanley steamers. Everybody here knows what a Stanley steamer is, right? Big cars, but, but comfortable cars. And so they would, people would get at the end of, of the, where the tracks ended and get off of the train and get on these cars that then would shuttle people as far south as Swamp, and then they could get to um, Santa Cruz. But it was that chunk right in the middle. So there was never the train that went the way they had envisioned it, all the way to Santa Cruz. The train ended just south of Half Moon Bay and then picked up a little bit outside of Santa Cruz. But it never was the, the full vision of what they had wanted. They wanted it to be the San Francisco seaside suburb. Now the railway, after the collapse in 2006, and it had to reconfigure itself, it, went, it, it started over as the, um, the Ocean Shore Railway changed to the Ocean Shore Railroad in 1909. It was incorporated then, so it's a separate organization that then took over all of what they've been doing. The investors believed in what they were doing, and I want to. Well, this is. Can everybody see? This is just sand dunes. You know, everybody knows what Pacifica is now. And let me tell you, when Bill Drake ran the Pacifica Tribune. He envisioned that Pacific would have 90,000 people in it. And that was a, a projection from the 1960s. And obviously that didn't happen. But it's still expensive to live here. They're putting up a couple of new houses in Pacific and they're all over $2 million. But this is a good vision of, of what it was like. Now here's a, here's the thing, Brighton Beach. Everybody knows that the school district used to be called Laguna Salada in Pacifica. 
this is Brighton Beach, and that would have been Laguna Salada. And what they wanted to do was have big resorts. Everybody's been to resorts in Mexico or San Diego or any, somewhere else. You know where a big resort is. You, it, it doesn't, it's not hard to understand why they thought this was great. Now, there's postcards of this, and there's vision of this. Uh, obviously, this never happened. Um, but there is a golf course at Laguna Salada that's owned by San Francisco. So you can sort of imagine what they wanted to happen and what they would have done with enough money. And something else happened that changed all their plans, and that was trucks and automobiles. Trucks and automobiles affected the plans of the Ocean Shore Railroad. All of a sudden, farmers didn't need the train, and they could move their produce on trucks and, and go over the Montero Mountain, that funny road there that many of you hiked on, and I've hiked on it, but it used to be a road that Every, that farmers could use to get their produce from Half Moon Bay up to San Francisco. So they didn't need the railroad. And that was one of the things that happened in addition to the earthquake. When the train was functioning, there's a, the funny story that I learned was that when it would, would come down to Valimar Station, where the Valimar restaurant is, the next station was Rockaway Beach. The train had to back up after it let people off had to back up, build up some speed to get up the hill at Rockaway Beach, to get over the little hump there and be on the, on the ledge and get to the, the Rockaway Beach station was where kind of the intersection of uh, Fassler and Highway 1, Rockaway, Rockaway Beach Avenue and Highway 1, that was, and that's, that station is gone, long gone. But it, it highlights the idea that it really was working. I mean, people, they kind of forget because it only worked for seven years, but it worked until it didn't. So I have something I wanted to read. Uh, about Devil's Slide. So this idea that in 1905, engineers, they looked at the craggy, picturesque, coast along northern San Mateo County, and they imagined a railroad hugging the cliffs as remarkable today as it was then. So the result would be riches for land speculators, homes for people seeking to live in a beautiful place. Uh, most of the time, this combination has proven successful. You're all proof of that. <laughs> it, it worked. People came here to live. So using dynamite and steam shovels, that the Ocean Shore Railway Company construction crews, they forged a path through and around some of the most treacherous territory in California. The reality of the problem, an ongoing headache, uh, I worked at the Tribune and went and stood on Devil's Slide and stood on a crack in the wall, uh, a crack in the floor that you could see straight down. Right now there's a huge amount of, uh, you all probably know about it, the, the where they, they, they put pins into the side of the wall to hold it, to keep it from falling. And then Caltrans said, we're never going to do it again. And people ask me, because I worked for the county, and I was I worked with uh, Supervisor Don Horsley on creating that park. And people say, well, you're going to fix it, aren't you? I mean, no. If it collapses, the county is not going to fix it. Caltrans was never going to fix it again. The tunnel is a permanent repair. And so we get to use that park, and because cars are not on it, I seriously doubt it's ever going to collapse unless there's a catastrophic earthquake, and Devil's Slide Park will be the least of our worries. <laughs> but it's nice that it's there. I, I love that on a, you know, on a nice, clear day. It's one of the best views in the world. And the rest of the time, you're inside a wet cotton ball. So you gotta, you got to pick your day to have a good time there. is an interesting aspect of, and, and unfortunately, the, the, the elements of the Half Moon Bay part aren't as interesting as the elements of the Pacifica and the Elgonaut and, the, and the, that part, because they, they just, it's a flat railroad track, and you know that it works. But Pater Point was a real problem, and so 
I would say went around, just like they do in Rockaway Beach, you can see this ledge. And they had a ledge that went around what is now Pacifica State Beach. Highway 1 is the exact same route that the railroad took, and, and you all know that. And then it went up and around Pater Point. And then they hit what the first tunnel, they built a small tunnel because they couldn't get up out of Pater Point. So the history of Pater Point in itself is probably deserving of a, of a book because the tunnel was abandoned when the railroad went away. And it became a place where bootleggers would hide inside the tunnel. Bootleggers would hide their booze and hide the things. And finally, the FBI and the federal government got sick of it, and they blew up the two ends of the tunnel. A lot of people don't know that there was a tunnel there, but if they do, they go, well, what happened to it, though? The government said, we're sick of this, and we're going to blow up the ends of it. So there's mystery. Kids grow up in Pacifica. My kids did anyway. <laughs> And I tell them these secret stories about ghosts and, and pirates and all of that stuff because who knows? There was a lot going on. And I and there were stories of a train a train engine in there also. Yeah. No, it's Do we the so this, this is this is a good picture of the problem, the challenge facing a little railroad. The railroad came around and then and then hit Half Moon Bay and the, and the artichoke fields and the view is the same now. When I rode down here, I looked out at the, at the agriculture. That was the same thing the train people saw. But the beautiful scene and vista is also the same thing that people saw. This is a good picture that really illustrates just why they had to build a tunnel. <laughs> They fixed this so many times. At one time, in, I think it was 1995 or 19, I don't know, there was a collapse and it was closed for six months. It was closed for, and a friend of mine, Mitch, um, Mitch Reed, who lived in Pacifica, but he worked in Mont he worked at the North End, his commute went from 12 minutes to two hours. Because <laughs> he had to go out of Pacifica, up and over and around. He, he was affected more than anybody in terms of a commute when that, that went out. But Pacifica became a cul-de-sac and we had no traffic at all. <laughs> a lot of people liked that part of the collapsing room. But um, the engineering of this, I mean, most of you know that the same kind of thing happened in Big Sur, but they don't have an option in Big Sur. They have to keep fixing that road in Big Sur. But this is so much higher this is a big, big deal to build that. This is what I would explain to you about. I mean, it was these big ice cream scoops of land that, that fell out 80 feet. And then they have a little building there. Some of you may have noticed there's a little tiny building up there. And it's a seismic, it, it, it measures on a daily basis. It's, it's, they're keeping track of it. And it's kind of interesting to see that. but. You can, you can see all of this stuff when you go onto the county park, but you can also see that it was a problem. Here are some pictures of them originally working on the Ocean Shore Railroad. Let me get out of the way. Um, this, this construction project was really, really complicated. A, bunch, a lot of our Greek workers were hired to, to do this, and I can't imagine how far. I mean, they, they used dynamite, and they used picks, and they used little, little um, wheeled uh, buggies. This is an example of the 2000, uh, 1906 collapse, and San Francisco on the bottom, and the, and the ocean shore helped, as I mentioned, it helped bring people uh, food, and, and it, was a, it was a nice little moment in time for the Ocean Shore Railroad to be supportive of San Francisco and helpful with San Francisco. It's another example of the kind of advertising that was done. Believe me, they really wanted to sell a lot of 
And let, me, I, let me read you just a little bit from this. It's, the first train on the Ocean Shore Railroad arrived at Edgemar at 11.42 on Tuesday, October 1st, after a run of 17 and a half minutes from Ocean View. 125 passengers and the officials of the railroad were aboard. The passengers were surprised and delighted with the wonderful beauty of the road along the great bluffs at Muscle Rock, where the breakers roll and flash their turbulent line of white hundreds of feet below. The first stop was at Edgemar. Edgemar is in the northern part of Pacifica, and I, I think, someone from Pacifica, would, I think that it ended up being a real estate office run by Barbara Clark before. And there's another uh, real estate office in the south, southern part in, in Half Moon Bay. The nearest seaside suburb. Take the ride and see for yourself. You will enjoy the day, see the wonders of the new road, and appreciate the beauties of Edgemar as a place for a home and the possibilities there for profitable investments. Come prepared to be convinced, for Edgemar will win you. It is the first station, the first beach, has a beauty all its own, and is being handled in a high-class, distinctive way. Good building restrictions, all improvements actually being put in now at our expense. Um, developers always use the same language. <laughs> but this was what year? What year was that? That was 1905. So here's some other another picture. I, I took this picture, and this this little ledge in Rockaway is the railroad track or with the railroad ledge the tracks. So. It was an exciting ride for people from San Francisco to come here and be on this. And, and a lot of people, a lot of contemporaneous people wrote stories in the newspapers and articles and said, it was scary. It was terrifying. <laughs> but they loved it. I mean, how many people were terrified driving their car over Devil's <laughs> And now people don't even pay attention because of the, it's, a, it's an amazing change. But the beauty is the same. And I, I just want to emphasize that. Okay, this is a, uh, where the route went, for those of you who may be curious about it. It went from San Francisco down to the coast, and you can see um, Tunitas is the last part, the last tr train part, and then people got onto their little Stanley steamer train uh, cars and went all the way down to Swamp. And then there was another you know, a, a small area of the train that went into Santa Cruz, but it just didn't work. And most people took the train back and forth to the beach and didn't use it to commute in between the two larger cities. And those that did, they had to sit in the car for about an hour in between the two ends of the tracks. Wavecrest is a name that's famous in Half Moon Bay. <laughs> has, a, has a long history all by itself, but that isn't this Wavecrest. It's just the, the idea that development on the coast was always linked with, well, people will want it and we can make money. So the fact that people wanted it is, you know, there's no question about it. Because it's beautiful. This is one of the electric locomotives. You know, I tried to find out why nobody else was using electric, and, and the only thing I can say is that the oil companies and the automobile industry was so powerful, they did not want any alternatives. And that's, you know, you can get that from who framed Roger Rabbit about the destruction of the Los Angeles sub, you know, train system, light rail, and then this little thing, this little train was ahead of its time. It was ahead of its time. some other examples of activity, a lot of people using the train, and then kind of a modern, futuristic looking car there at the bottom. This is the picture of the kind of Stanley steamer that I mentioned that they had to use to bring people back and forth. 
It's probably pretty fun on a nice day, but <laughs> no, it's hard to. This is a picture that's in my book that's also pretty well known. That's the train going through a very empty Sharp Park area. Um, sort of from up on the hill. There, there's only one major building, um, not counting the, the, the Little Brown Church, but how many people have ever been inside the castle in Pacifica? People here? You know, that was built in 1908, so that was still there when the Ocean Shore Railroad was working. And that's the McCloskey family, as you probably all know. There aren't very many other buildings in Pacifica that are that famous that are around, other than the Sanchez Adobe, which is a different story. <laughs> but I always like this picture because it shows you just, just how empty that part of Pacifica was. This is probably one of the more famous pictures that is published in many books and many uh, you know, websites. And it's kind of a cool picture because it shows uh, well, it's self-evident what it shows. It's a real train. This was a real train carrying hundreds of people in every back and forth, back and forth to the beach. Nobody really commuted on it, which was what they wanted, which is why it couldn't survive, because it needed a commuting public, not just a, a weekend, let's go to the beach. Here's another image of the Brighton Beach fantasy. And then I wanted, I wanted to have this picture in my book, too, because the farm industry, at one time, the artichokes that came out of what is now Pacifica was the number one place in the world where they're growing artichokes. So there was a tremendous amount of money in transporting artichokes. And the train was excited about that until the farmers and the, said, no, we don't need the train. We can, we can do it faster with trucks and automobiles, and that was, a, that was a knife in the heart of the railroad train, not just the collapse. Here's some, this is, this is an area, Pedro, uh, Point San Pedro, probably where um, Montero Beach is in that area, looking north, and even then, it was just a gorgeous view. Right. I've got uh, some, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Vargas Brothers. This is, this is them. And they built these models of the Ocean Shore Railroad. And they were eventually in what is now the Best Western Hotel in the lobby. They've been in Kathleen Manning's place. I think they're now, I hope it's not covered with a tent, right? No, it's at the museum. OK, it's moved to the museum. So go to the Pacifica Museum to see this. And it's also at the Balamar Station restaurant still. There's smaller dioramas. And if you go have a crab sandwich or something and take a look at these models, there's I think there's two there. But the large one is at the History Museum, which is um, the old Little Brown Church, which is so spectacular, just like your Half Moon Bay Museum. Really connects the community. The new the Pacifica Museum is also great. But these guys, they, they became internationally famous. They did models of trains, all kinds of trains, all kinds of places, and they were, they were hired to do, I think they did, you know, the, the building, uh, they told me what they were going to do, the, that Frank Lloyd Wright building in, in uh, Mar Marin, that's the county government center, that's one of, the, one of his buildings, they were going to do a model of that, they were doing all kinds of models, but they were really excited about this. Now here's an, here's an example of something a lot of people don't know, because my daughters went to Ocean Shore School. Uh, I was a, we were a big part of it. And people asked me, well, what happened to all of those owners of the Ocean Shore Railroad right away? And I said, well, you know, that's a PhD real estate um, thesis. But I can tell you what happened with one of them. There were some, this Ocean Shore School got some money through a tax, like all the schools in Pacifica, through a tax bond, and they started to rebuild it, and a corner, a corner of it, infringed on the Ocean Shore Railroad right away. And, and since it was owned by very different people, the individuals who had that particular location, they sued. 
And they got $250,000 from the Pacifica School District, which could have done a lot with it, but they would have been more expensive to move the school. So it's one of the little details about the Ocean Shore Railroad that a lot of people don't realize. It. And I think that things like that have happened all up and down, where someone owns the right of way and, and won't let people cross or won't let people build or what. I, mean, I, I can't tell you all the details. This is one that I know happened because I wrote about it and have it on kind of my watch as a tribute. That's a, a live picture of it. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because there's experts on it in the room, but there is an old Ocean Shore Railroad car that is being repaired under, I think it's 12 years now or something. I mean, they're working on it forever. The Pacifica Tribune was one of the first donators who gave some money to the History Society. And they are renovating it as a museum. And it's now in the parking lot of the museum, of the Pacifica Museum on Francisco. And the people that have done that, they're amazing carpenters, and they work, and they work on it. Anyway, I just wanted to say that there were some Ocean Shore Railroad you know, things that ended up being put in the backyard somewhere, or in a field in, in Ukiah, or just, it just all crumbled and fell apart. And this is a good example of some of the museum saving it, 50 were saving it. This is from Nix, looking at, um, at this beautiful site, and people fish there and surf there. But it is, in fact, you can see the little ledge of where the old Ocean Shore Railroad was. It's, it's also, you can see that it is gradually collapsing. It's changed significantly in the 30 years that I've been in Pacific. And I have pictures going back to 1990, 91, where you can actually see the ledge a lot better. I mentioned that any of these things that are available on the Pacifica Historical Society website, you can go and, and look at how many are there? A hundred? Yeah, just so many. So I'd like to take some questions if there's we're running pretty close to the end of the, of the night, so I appreciate it. Yeah. So you've repeat, you've repeated something that I've heard. So you're saying when the train was in Rockaway, it had a backup and get, get build-up speed to get where? Oh, to get past the Rockaway Station up onto the hill of Rockaway, the Rockaway Hill. So they would pick up, as far as I've been able to figure out, they would pick up people in Rockaway, but instead of going forward, they would have to back up to get some ahead of speed. Well, isn't that roadway and the cliff along the, uh, between Rockaway and Lincoln, isn't that roughly the same elevation? Uh, they well, go up over the hill and no, but it was, it was high enough that they needed to get it to go around. <coughs> but you're right. Yep. I was just wondering if you were talking about the original man in my picture. I wonder if one reason why they didn't do that is that the building in the back of the eroding cliff, if you have a landslide, it could also wipe out your electrical. You have to repair not just the track, but the electrical wire too. Yeah, and I would also guess they would use the train to bring the repair materials in. And if your electric system is down, that would be done. Yeah, I, I, that, that makes perfect sense. I can't hear the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a He was curious about why the electric train didn't work, and, and because probably the same reason that people were reluctant to have electric cars or like the, oh well if we lose the power there's no train but the idea that they thought or anticipated there would be an earthquake that would destroy all of their work they were optimistic they were very optimistic just like we are today oh there'll be an earthquake someday but maybe not while we're in the middle of building a railroad <laughs> you mentioned southern pacific and the competition yeah into that a little more detail well as you know, the history of railroads in America is about competition and trying to get rid of the competitor. Um, and South Southern Pacific did not want this little railroad to come from San Francisco to Santa Cruz easily. And so what they did, because they had control of their right of way, they put a spur line right across where the 
train would go. So it, it eliminated the ability to have the kind of access that they had in San Francisco. And, and the history of Southern Pacific is way more than I could go into today, but it, it, it is a, all the railroads in this country were very competitive with each other and, and did whatever they could to prevent the other person, the other railroad from being successful. Um, they're still is, doing it. Is, is it true, just probably a question, is it true that, um, that Southern Pacific had a line from San Francisco down to Santa Cruz along the bay? Um, they, 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 had, they had commercial stuff, yeah. yeah there so was a railroad that went from San Francisco to Redwood City. Why it's called Redwood City is that it was used for lumber. And the, half, the Ocean Shore Railroad at one time said, well, gee, we can build a spur, our own spur, into the timber, you know, go and go east from around Halfland Bay at that time. And so they were, there were plans to be able to use all of the needs of this area for the railroad. They were, there was an effort to make sure they could capitalize on all of it. Yeah? Uh, do, how many railroad stations are actually still in existence? I know there are three, one in El Verona and two in Half Moon Bay, but are there others that are still around? Yeah. Um, this is a question that people always ask, and, and I'm just curious, and, and there is... Um, we didn't hear the question. The, oh, the question was how many railroad stations of this railroad still exists. And as I showed you, that the, there were a lot of stations. The, one, the most prominent one are the Pacifica Valmar Station restaurant and a private residence in Pedro Point, which is what's called the Tobin Station, which if you squint, you can, you can imagine it being a, a railroad station. And then there's some, some others that like Ar Arlita, it sort of just looks like an old barn near the coast, but it was an, it was turned into a home. A lot of these stations were bought by real estate companies, and they turned them into real estate offices. Um, they're the, the best one to, to imagine it being a railroad station is the restaurant, in my opinion. Yeah? In the Jersey of Capistrano, what used to be the Capistrano restaurant at the yeah. of Capistrano in 92, and Monterra. Yeah, there's a handful of them. But Monster Chef, where Monster Chef was in Princeton, that was a station as well. Yeah. Do you know specifically where the Swanton Terminus was? Well, I tried to find it once, um, driving down to Santa Cruz. And, you know, there's a Swanton Road, and I think it was up off of Swanton Road, but I don't know. I never could find any evidence of it. But I, I think that because the, the cars went back and forth and that didn't, didn't really have a tremendous amount of use, um, that line to Santa Cruz, because they didn't ever build a really good station in Santa Cruz. They couldn't. Yeah? Did the railroad, did they put up schedules? Did they end up taking the riders? Oh, yeah. Are there any examples? So the question is, can the railroad put up schedules and have tickets? Are there examples out there? Well, there's a lot online, but you know, I guess if you found one. Yeah, this is the kind of schedule. He asked about schedules for the. Oh, they have it. It was a functioning railroad. Yeah. 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 Right. For that, for, uh, let me let me emphasize that yeah. the details like that are available at the museum, online, and like I have a picture of the schedule in my book that I got, which it it just it's amazing what it says. And, um, reaches the beaches of our event, the depot from 12th and Mission Street, and they have San Francisco, 16th Street, 24th Street, Onondago, Palmetto, Daly City, Thornton, Muscle Rock, Edgemar, Salada, Bright, Valimar, Rockaway, Tobin, uh, Ransom, Green Canyon, Montero, Farallon, Moss Beach, Marine, Princeton, North Granada, Granada, South Granada, Miramar, Half Moon Bay, and Arleta. And that was the last one. There was a lot of stations. There was a lot of activity. 
Yes, sir. The D is not with the company, and uh, that reports to service by the government. Uh huh. So that comes out of the South Yeah. That's those parts of the I don't know if it was part of it because that concrete you're talking about that port, that big yeah, concrete. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know for sure. I don't. I think that was a whole different, you know, under different enterprise that concrete. What year was it actually operating? Oh, well, it's 1905, and then it collapsed in 1906, and they rebuilt it in 1909, and then it went bankrupt in 1911, and then it worked on and struggled on with different people trying to buy it different people, until about 1920 and then it was gone. But the most active period was between 1911 and about 1913. <coughs> yes? One, there was a train station that was here in Happy Bay. Mm -hmm. It was moved a couple of times. Uh, Part of a church, right? Yeah, well, it's not over on Higgins, but it's Johnson. Uh -huh. So it's used for meetings. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great facility. Yeah. 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 So the uh, yes, it was originally part of the Methodist Church. Yeah. So what one of the the Hapsal Day stations that was at the end of Kelly Avenue was moved to the uh, Methodist Church for a while. It is now uh, next to, near the Johnson Hall Park House. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question was in San Francisco. <laughs> What station or what area did the trains come out of? They didn't go down to Third Street, correct? They came well, like from uh, Alamany, that is the main road, and they came into Daly City and then to Muscle Rock and then and then south. So it hit the coast at Daly City and then turned left into the Pacific Coast. It started in twelfth and Mission, I think. That's, that's what it says on the on, on the, the, the um, the thing that I just read. Yeah. Sixteenth Sixteenth Street. Yeah. yeah. That was the station Sixteenth Street that began at San Francisco. It was. So I mean. Yeah. I can make an announcement quick. Um, please take more questions. But um, we also, along the back, uh, we, we put up three uh, poster boards with uh, more pictures. Most of them were before seen in the church talk, but this way you can see what it um, And also, uh, Joe Fryer, our, our African Bay History Association bottle expert, has a bottle. <laughs> Some trash that somebody would have dumped from uh, being on the train coming down here. Oh, and there was a cache of them found, and most of them are in the Pacific uh, Museum. So you see it's solarized purple, so it fits in perfectly with the peak of the railroad, the timing-wise of this bottle. Well, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight and talking about this. I, like I said, when I drove down here today, I thought it's the same draw, it's the same interest in that. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you.